So yeah, Doug Shakshubra, performance engineering with Bill Gray, um, our HPC expert. Um, so today we're gonna explore with Benjamin Berg uh, kind of how to optimally schedule uh, parallel jobs across uh, a set of hosts, whether it's a cluster, whether it's a supercomputing center. And um, at Red Hat, we obviously look at uh, our own, the Linux kernel and scheduler, and we're, we're all about trying to make sure the operating systems can can share resources as efficiently as possible because performance is like money. So the faster you can run uh, and get higher throughputs, the uh, you know the more you save in in compute time and and uh, and purchases. So, Bill, do you want to dig in a little on your side? I think there are some fascinating questions that come up on how to best allocate the resources and what order to run the jobs and how to, whether to put the job together or sequentially, all kinds of interesting, interesting things that Ben's gonna talk about. Yeah, so without further ado, uh, uh, Ben, Benjamin Berg uh, from CMU. Of course, an easy mistake, right? Um, okay, so th thanks to everyone at Red Hat, thanks for the introduction, and you know, thanks to Heidi for, for organizing this. Uh, my name is Ben Berg, I'm gonna talk about optimal resource allocation for parallelizable jobs. Uh, and this is actually gonna be summarizing results from a couple of our recent papers. And the idea is to sort of give an overview of the kind of research that I do with my advisor, Moore Harkle Balter, in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. And, uh, and Moore will be joining the uh, question and answer session after so we can have a nice uh, group conversation. Um, but just to get started, you know, almost all modern computer systems are built to exploit parallelism in some way. So this could be the multi-core chip in your laptop. This could be parallelizing across many cores in a, in a supercomputing center, or maybe this is parallelizing across servers in a data center. And uh, I'm gonna use the language of servers in a data center here today, but a lot of the lessons I'm gonna discuss apply equally in these other cases as well. Um, and, and to get an idea of our research, you know, I, it helps to outline sort of where the challenges are in parallel computing. So sort of the central challenge in parallel computing is that I have all of these parallel resources, whether they're cores or processors, um, and that's a lot of theoretical performance, but it's hard to really fully leverage these available resources, right? And so this, this problem takes a couple of different forms, right? There are some people that work on this question of how to build parallel code. And this is like parallel algorithms research or programming languages research and how to make it easier to write parallel programs. Some people think about sort of okay, once I've built my parallel program, how do I execute a single parallel job? So I have a single parallel job, it's composed of some parallelizable tasks. Uh, and I wanna know how to effectively map these parallelizable tasks onto servers in order to parallelize my job. So this is you know, the kind of question that's addressed by OpenMP or Intel's thread building blocks on a multi-core uh, machine or you know, in the, in the data center setting, this is something that would be addressed by MapReduce or another DAG scheduler. Um, and then there's this third question, which is, let's say I have many parallel jobs. So I have many different jobs and each job is itself a parallelizable job composed of parallelizable tasks. How do I allocate resources across these many parallelizable jobs? Uh, and this is the kind of thing addressed by the, you know, the Linux scheduler, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with maybe the uh, Slurm cluster manager, which is frequently used in, in supercomputing centers, or something like a Kubernetes scheduler that would show up in a data center for scheduling across many servers. Um, and our research sort of tries to generally address these kinds of issues through the lens of performance modeling. So here the goal is to build mathematical models of how computer systems work and then use math to optimize the design of these systems. Um, and it's always the case that, you know, you're not going to build a model that's going to perfectly system that sort of captures the main ideas in these systems and then allows us to use theory as a guide or sort of inspiration for the design of, of better computer systems. Um, so in particular, I want to talk today about how we use this performance modeling approach um, to tackle this third problem here about how to allocate resources across many parallel jobs. So in building a model uh, to tackle this problem, there are a couple high level ideas that we wanna be sure to, to encapsulate that are sort of the most important features for our model to have. So first, um, 
you know, we have observed that sort of modern frameworks in this space support dynamic allocation of resources over time. So in particular, jobs can be checkpointed and resumed. Um, and as a result, re the resources allocated to a job can change over time. So I can actually change the number of servers that a job runs on over time. And there will be some overhead associated with this dynamic allocation, but there's a lot of research in, into how to, to mitigate this overhead. And, and we have a lot of effective solutions here. So we're gonna assume that this is a fairly cheap operation um, that I can reallocate servers over time. The other thing we want to be sure to capture in our model is this idea of limited parallelism. And the easiest way to see this is to look at what I'll call a speedup function. So here I have a number of servers on the x-axis and a speedup function on the y-axis. And you know, I think we're all sort of familiar with this, right? A perfect speedup function would look something like this green line, right? This is, a, this is sort of the ideal speedup function. It tells me that a job would run twice as fast on two servers as it would on a single server or three times as fast on three servers. But what we know in practice is that jobs actually follow speed up functions that look more like this red line. So this is sort of more realistic. You know, a job won't quite run twice as fast on two servers or three times as fast on three servers. And so we want to encapsulate this in our model somehow. And in order to, to encapsulate this idea of limited parallelism, we need to define what I'll call a job size. So a job size is going to be defined as the job's running time on a single server. And you can think of a job size as reflecting the amount of inherent work associated with a job. So let's say um, you know, I'm doing some machine learning training job where I have to train a model. You could think of that, that job size as being sort of related to the number of iterations required to train the model. Or if I'm doing some sort of data analysis, maybe the job size is related to the number of data points I have to analyze. Uh, to complete my data analysis. But really, it's it's this amount of inherent work. And I'm going to combine this idea with, again, this idea of a job speedup function. So all jobs I'm going to assume are going to obey one of these um, speedup functions that look like this realistic red curve here. So in general, we'll assume these are increasing concave functions that lie somewhere below this ideal green line. Um, and a speedup function is going to be defined as how many times faster a job runs on K servers than on a single server, right? So to put these two ideas together, I can then determine how long it would take to run a job on K servers, right? In general, it will take the job size divided by its speed up to run on K servers. So just to see a couple examples here, you know, we could consider the case where we have a job of size six and we wanna know how long it would take to run this job on a single server. Right, well, there are two questions to answer here, which is how many times faster does the job run on K servers than on one server? And sort of by definition, this speed up on one server is one. And then I just apply this formula, the job size divided by its speed up to see that the job takes time six to run on a single server. And this is totally compatible with my definition of job size, which is my running time on a single server. You know, a slightly more complicated example, maybe I want to run this job on eight servers instead. Well, now I answer the same two questions, but I see that my job speed up on eight servers is three, meaning I run three times faster on eight servers as I would on a single server. So my running time then is six divided by three or time two. So even though my job has some limited parallelism, I still get a significant benefit from running on eight servers instead of one server. And that's how we'll sort of model this idea of job size and limited parallelism. So to bring it all together, here's our, our sort of basic model for the rest of the talk. Um, we're gonna have some model of a data center. So here's a data center composed of N servers. Here is N is 16. And this data center is gonna be tasked with running some set of jobs. And I'll allow my data center to, uh, to allocate any number of servers to any job. So in, for example, I could um, allocate all 16 of my servers to this blue job here. Um, and, you know, I, I can use the, you know, the kind of math that I, I showed on the previous slides to see how long it will take to, to, to finish the job in this case. And for each job, I'm going to define what I'll call a response time. So a job's response time is defined to be the amount of time that elapses from when the job first arrives to the system until the job is completed. And in general, 
Our goal in this talk will be to minimize the mean response time across jobs so that the average time across all of the jobs from when the job arrives to the system until the job is completed. And um, you know, because we have this ability to reallocate servers, I'll allow our allocation policies in the system to out reallocate servers whenever they want. So for example, I could start in this allocation of 16 servers to the blue job, and then I could sort of reallocate some servers to this purple job, reallocate some servers to the, the green job and the red job, and I could end up at this other allocation, and I can change these allocations as my job runs. So the sort of big question for today's talk is, how to allocate servers to jobs in order to minimize this mean response time, given this ability to, to dynamically allocate servers over time. So um, I'm now going to sort of summarize a couple of our recent results uh, using this model on how to optimally allocate resources. So the first case I want to consider is what I'll call the unknown job size case. So in the unknown job size case, I have jobs that arrive to the system, but they don't announce their, their sizes to the system, right? It's often hard maybe to, to estimate exactly what a job size is, I, sorry, I don't know, or the system isn't told when the user submits the job. So I have these jobs of unknown size, and all I can really assume is that these unknown job sizes, X1 and X2 in this example, are independent and identically distributed, drawn from some underlying distribution, and, and sort of not told to the system. So the question is, uh, you know, in this case, um, what does an optimal allocation policy look like? Uh, you know, what are some even good ideas for what we might want to try to do? Right. So the most intuitive options here would be, you know, perhaps what I want to do is just allocate all of my servers to one of the jobs and run the jobs for one at a time in in sequence. Right. So I'm parallelizing individual jobs, but I'm only running one job. And you know maybe another thing I could try and do perhaps is um, instead of allocating all of the servers to one of the jobs, maybe I want to split them, right? So I have all of these servers. Maybe I want to equally split my servers between these jobs. I'll you know give eight servers to the to the blue job and eight servers to the purple job. And these are sort of uh, you know ends of an extreme. So maybe there's some allocation that sits here in the middle. Uh, maybe there's some like 75, 25 split that's like the best of both worlds, and maybe that's what I would do. So uh, I'll I'll open it up to the moderators here. I mean, intuitively, you know, which of these policies sounds like a good idea for what we might want to do in this in this case? Right. So, so again, I'll I'll start because um, I would think by just um, you know optimally allocating the jobs across the uh, across the set of nodes would be optimal because uh, which should keep most of them busy. Right. So you're 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 sort of saying you know biasing towards kind of this equal the split equal end split, of the spectrum. Exactly. Right. And 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 somehow that feels kind of like efficient, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering. Right. That so, why that's necessarily better than um, just giving all the resources to the jobs as they come. I have another question too. Um, are all these jobs similar workloads with similar workload levels and scaling curves? Does that matter or will you talk about that? Yeah, so 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 that's a great question. So um, we are going to assume at least for, for starters that um, you can imagine this workload as being all the same type of job. So similar scaling behavior. Um, even if we don't know exact job sizes, you know, the same underlying job size distribution. And uh, a little bit later in the talk, I'll, 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 um, I'll discuss the case where maybe we're mixing different kinds of jobs yes, together. Um, but you, you had sort of said your, your first question, I, I think, was sort of why is it necessarily better to spread things out, right? Maybe I actually want to do things more. Or give all the resources to and, the first job and let it finish. Right, right. And I think, you know, the intuition there is. Um, like we saw in, in the example calculating job sizes, right? I mean, that gives the highest speed up possible, right, to one of our jobs, right? So if we look at the um, speed up function of maybe allocating all of our servers to this blue job, you know, we look at the speed up function, we do get the highest possible speed up um, for one of our jobs by, by pushing it out there. Unfortunately, you know, if you look at the speed up function, moving all the way out that far onto the speed up function is really highly inefficient. 
Meaning if I look at the difference between running on seven servers versus running on eight servers, there was hardly any benefit to, to giving that additional server to, uh, to my blue job. So you, know, you can imagine if I'm allocating all 16 servers to my blue job, right? it's not clear that I'm getting sort of the most bang for my buck there. And so I want to investigate you know, what, what Shaq proposed, which is actually split, spreading things out, right? moving to this equal allocation. And it turns out that this is a policy that um, has been described previously in the literature called equi, which just provides an equal allocation, splits the servers equally across all the jobs. Um, and we can actually mathematically show that, that um, Shaq's intuition here is correct, that equi actually maximizes system efficiency. So to see why this is true, let's look at um, what, you know, the speed up function for these jobs and consider what allocation is used by the equi policy. So if I have n servers in the system and I have i jobs, the allocation that equi will use is to give n divided by i servers to each of my jobs. Right, and let's compare that to any arbitrary unequal allocation of servers. So here I'm showing some unequal allocation of servers to the jobs. And I, I want to sort of compare these two things. And in particular, I want to think about what happens when I move from doing the equi allocation to doing some other unequal allocation. So if we think about that, you know, we can do that move by taking some servers away from some jobs and reallocating servers to other jobs. That'll move us from our equal allocation to an unequal allocation. And when we do this move, the number of servers that we take away has to equal the number of servers that we reallocate. And that ensures that you know, we've allocated all of the servers in our system under our unequal allocation. But what we can see is that when we take away a server, there's some cost, right? There's some decrease in speed up for some of our jobs when we take servers away. And when we reallocate servers, there's some benefit because we increase the speed up of those, those uh, jobs that receive additional servers. But because our speed up function is this increasing concave function, the cost of taking each server away from a job is going to outweigh the benefit of adding a server. So this equi allocation is actually maximizing the total system efficiency because it gets the highest sort of total speed up of the system. And it turns out that when uh, job sizes are unknown and exponentially distributed, this is a sufficient condition for equi to be the optimal policy. So by maximizing system efficiency, we can show that equi actually minimizes the mean response time across jobs in this unknown job size case. So now that we understand a little bit about the unknown job size case, I wanna, I wanna think about this related problem of what happens now when we know job sizes. So instead of having jobs of unknown size, I'll have jobs of different sizes, but we'll assume that these job sizes are, are known exactly to the system, right? So you can imagine, you know, users submit jobs and they sort of announce how much work they plan to do, or they tell their exact job sizes to the system. So that information can be exploited by an allocation policy. And sort of the big question is, how does knowing this job size information change our, our answer to the question of the optimal allocation policy? In particular, right, given this a case with known job sizes, do we want to keep doing equi? Right? Is equi still the best we can do? Um, perhaps now that we know the job sizes, for example, we want to exploit that by choosing to allocate more servers to the big jobs. Right? We know these big jobs, they're going to require a lot of service. Maybe we want to get them out of the, out of the system quickly. On the other hand, you know, maybe we, we, for some reason, want to go the other way and actually allocate more servers to small jobs. So again, you know, I'll, I'll open this up to the moderators. I mean, does, does knowing the job size information sort of change your answer to what seems like a good allocation policy? You know, so at first glance, again, I, it feels to me, which is, again, uh, and this is what we originally said when we rehearsed this, too, that actually the big jobs I personally thought that thought that the big jobs would um, would be good to get through the system first. Well, it makes sense because they require the most resources, right? But maybe that's not what's actually true. Right. So, so, so both of you sort of identify, right, that like somehow this this argument that all we can do is is sort of throw our hands up and and, and maximize efficiency with equity. I mean, that's um, that somehow no longer sounds attractive, right? There's There's got to be a way to exploit the size information to, to, to make the situation better. Um, so I think you're, you're on the right track there. 
Um, but sort of where I'll, where I'll differ is that um, in general, what we see in, in queuing theoretic literature is that it actually tends to be better to favor small jobs when you're optimizing for response time. So I want to take a brief detour and actually consider um, you know, the, the single server case here. So the case where we only have a single server, we don't have to worry about parallelism, but let's say we have you know, the same set of jobs that have to be processed on this single server. It turns out that from the queuing theoretic literature, we're told the optimal policy in this case is to process the jobs with the shortest remaining processing time first. That means picking the, the shortest job, which in this case is this blue job, and running it solely by itself on the single server until it finishes, and then moving on to the job with the shortest remaining processing time after that, which would be this red job, sort of, and then this purple job, and you would run the largest job last. And this order in the single server case will minimize mean response time. You generally don't want short jobs to have to queue behind long jobs. Um, so, you know, uh, one basic idea is maybe we want to just apply this exactly to this, this uh, multi-server case with parallelizable jobs. But again, we don't really want to give strict priority to any one job, right? We're still in this case where if we gave all of the servers to one individual job, we would end up in this highly inefficient region. So we want to we want to sort of exploit this um, job size information by favoring short jobs, but we don't want to move into this highly inefficient region on any one speed up curve. So we can actually derive the optimal policy in this case, which is to do something called high efficiency SRPT or HE SRPT. And what this policy does is it favors short jobs, but it makes sure that we don't move too far into the inefficient region on any jobs speed up curve. So I can show you actually what this thing looks like in practice, I just have to define a little bit of notation. So here, this theta star sub i of t is going to denote the optimal allocation to the ith largest job at time t when there are m of t jobs in the system. And theta here will be a fraction of the total system. So it'll be some number between 0 and 1, and that's the fraction of the n servers that the ith largest job will receive. And I'm going to make one more uh, technical uh, assumption here, just for simplicity in this case, which is that the speed up function is of the form uh, s of k is k to the p. So, you know, for example, s of k might be like the square root of k. And if this is the case, then I can write this optimal allocation function as follows here. So it's this sort of complicated expression. You know, it doesn't necessarily have a great intuitive interpretation, but I can show you what this looks like in practice for this set of jobs that we were just considering on the previous slide. So you know, if I actually wanted to do the optimal allocation to minimize the mean response time for these jobs, I would use this allocation during the first period of time. So I would allocate the highest number of servers, the highest fraction of the system um, to this blue job. And then I would allocate sort of in size order from there on. And the consequence of that is that I'll finish the shortest job first, right? I'll finish this blue job first. And then I'll continue to use um, different allocations, but I'll continue to sort of favor the shorter jobs. But crucially, right, I'm not giving a strict priority to any job in the system. I'm making sure that the overall system of the, or sorry, the overall efficiency of the system is maintained while favoring short jobs. So I'll continue to finish uh, jobs in shortest job first order until only the green job remains. And then of course it can, it can utilize the whole system. So now that we've seen a couple of results uh, in this area, I want to take a minute to talk about sort of open problems, right? And in particular, I want to address this issue that, that uh, Bill mentioned earlier, which is this question of multiple speedup functions. So, so far, I've assumed that all jobs follow a single speedup function. Um, and this is a realistic assumption if maybe I'm processing one kind of job, right? This is you know one program with different inputs. It's the same kind of data analysis. Maybe I'm training the same model on different inputs, um, but you know the job sort of scales in the same way. But it's really easy to imagine cases where the scaling behavior of my jobs is different because I'm actually processing different types of jobs, right? In particular, I, I can imagine maybe I have two speed up functions like s1 of k and s2 of k. So I have some S1 of K that looks like this red line, and I have some S2 of K that looks like this blue line. So I have some more parallelizable jobs and some less parallelizable jobs. Um, and in general, it turns out 
that this problem is open. So no one knows in, in general what the optimal policy is for minimizing mean response time when I have jobs that follow multiple speed up functions, even, even just two speed up functions. Um, and to show everyone why that's sort of like a tricky problem, I think it makes sense to look at a simpler special case, which, uh, which seems simple, but is still a hard problem to solve. So I'm gonna constrain the forms of my speed up functions a little to consider this special case. So I'm gonna consider the special case of elastic and inelastic jobs. So in, the, in this case, I'm gonna describe elastic jobs as jobs with a perfect speed up function. So they actually have this ideal speed up function where jobs run twice as fast on two servers or four times as fast on four servers. And these are my more parallelizable jobs. In my less parallelizable jobs, I'm gonna assume follow something like that looks like this red speed up curve. So these are inelastic jobs and they fall, they get a perfect speed up, but only up until some threshold point. And then after that threshold point, inelastic jobs receive no additional benefit from, from receiving um, you know, that, that next server. So I clearly have more and less parallelizable jobs here, but, but somehow this seems like a simpler problem. Um, just to round it out, let's consider the case where jobs are again unknown and exponentially distributed. But to reflect this idea that um, these are really two different classes of traffic that are being mixed together, we'll consider the case where elastic jobs can have a different average size than inelastic jobs, right? So elastic job sizes are drawn from one exponential distribution and inelastic job sizes are drawn from potentially a different inelastic or different exponential job size distribution. So these two different classes of traffic have to be um, allocated resources. Um, again, I wanna ask, you know, intuitively, what are some good sounding policies in this case? In particular, you know, we saw that there might be advantages before to favoring short jobs or favoring long jobs in the system. Has that answer changed because now we have, you know, these different classes of traffic? Um, somehow it sounds good again to, to favor these elastic jobs. You know, our big problem before was that we didn't wanna end up on the uh, inefficient region of any curve, but these elastic jobs sort of have perfect efficiency, so maybe we should favor them. And on the other hand, you know, maybe there's some benefit, I don't know, to, to getting these inelastic jobs out of the system quickly. So uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up. Um, based on what you've seen so far in the talk, I mean, what, what sort of intuition do you have in this case about what, what the goals of a good allocation policy would be in this multiple speed up function case? Yes, yeah, so this is Shaq again. Um, just, um, it's a very tricky problem. We actually have some other benchmarks and workloads that um, that actually measure the the beginning job going out to the very last of the end job going in. So, typically, the intuition would say to run to favor the um, the inelastic jobs, right, so that you get them potentially out of the way. We but again, we'll love to see the results. Yeah, that, that's my intuition too. I mean, we know something about the maximum parallelizability of those inelastic things, right? And so maybe if we right. get rid of them, then the elastic jobs can use all of the resources that are available. So that, that's, my, that's my choice. Right, so, so I think that that's, that's good intuition on both fronts, right? I mean, just to sort of answer this sort of like maybe the first decision axis here, right? I think um, all of our arguments about why it's good to finish short jobs first still apply in this case. So, so one desirable quality of, a, of an allocation policy would still be to favor these short jobs. Um, but I think you all both nailed it, um, which is that these inelastic jobs, while it doesn't necessarily sound so great, um, you know, getting those out of the system quickly will leave us in these cases in the future where our elastic jobs can really grow to make use of all of the available resources. On the other hand, if we were to complete the elastic jobs first, we could end up in this case where we have lots and lots of available servers and only a few inelastic jobs, which are limited in their degree of parallelism and really can't make full use of the available resources. So I might get left somehow with like idle servers in that case. So you can think of like saving the elastic jobs for later as like saving flexibility in the system to allow me to run more efficiently in the future. So another desirable 
quality of, of an allocation policy, as you, you both pointed out, is to favor these inelastic jobs and get them out of the system quickly. And what this means is that our answer to the optimal allocation policy really depends on the system parameters. So in the first case, right, we can imagine the case where inelastic jobs are smaller on average than elastic jobs. And in this case, um, it's actually not so bad to derive what the optimal policy is. Uh, we were able to do this in a recent uh, paper, um, which is that we want to use a policy called inelastic first. And this inelastic first policy gives priority to the inelastic jobs, meaning it allocates each inelastic job up to its threshold, up to the point where it would receive no, no additional benefit. And then whatever servers are left over, it allocates those to the elastic job. And here we're able to favor both the inelastic jobs and the smaller jobs simultaneously, right? There's no conflict here. And this turns out to be the optimal policy. On the other hand, if we have elastic jobs, which are smaller on average in terms of job size than the inelastic jobs, now we have two conflicting goals, right? We want to favor small jobs. But we've also said we would rather complete inelastic jobs quickly to sort of preserve flexibility in our system. So now we have this trade-off between preserving flexibility by deferring elastic jobs and completing the smaller jobs first. And so it turns out that this problem is wide open. This is an active area of research for us. And um, we've gotten a couple of preliminary results, but it's, it's really a wide open area um, that we're eager to make progress on. So just to uh, quickly wrap up, uh, talk today about a model for server allocation. And um, we considered allocation policies that dynamically reallocate resources to parallelizable jobs over time. We thought about jobs which have some inherent work, and then we modeled the limited parallelism of these jobs by considering their speed up curves. Given this model, we were able to show the optimal policy in a case with unknown job sizes is equi, and that we want to do this HESRPT policy when job sizes are known to the system. Then finally, we talked about some open problems, in particular this case of multiple speed up functions, which is really an open problem, even in the special case where we have elastic and inelastic jobs. Um, so at this point, I'll open it up to the moderators uh, or perhaps you know, people in the chat if you want to chime in or um, more than happy to take questions uh, with Moore, who's a co-author on much of this work uh, in, the, in the upcoming Q&A session. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, excellent, Ben. And I do believe I'll probably move most of the discussion over to the Q and A session. Great, um, I'll I'll head there now, and I'm happy to answer anyone's questions. But uh, th thanks all for attending virtually. Excellent. Thanks for uh, thanks for um, sharing this with us. So maybe while other people join join the session, I, I'm curious about you know like tie-ins with. Uh, traditional queuing theory, right? Where you have, have a single queue and multiple servers. I mean, is this sort of following that same same uh, theory to get them yeah. the first time? Yeah, so um, so so SRPT in particular, the, the, the result that I referenced there is like a little bit of an atypical result in queuing theory because it's it's a super strong result. So it turns out that for any given arrival sequence of jobs of any sizes, um, you can show that it's that the SRPT is optimal. Um, and so a lot of the work that you see in more traditional queuing theory to get optimality results or to get an analytic results has to make certain stochastic assumptions. Um, but those are exactly the kinds of assumptions that we made um, in that, that first part of the talk where I was talking about jobs of unknown sizes. So the reasons we assume things like a stochastic arrival process of jobs arriving in the system and um, randomly drawn job sizes from an underlying distribution, that all, all of that math turns out looks a lot like traditional queuing theory. And that's, um, that's certainly Moore's background and, and my background to, to a, maybe a lesser extent is in that sort of really traditional queuing theory literature. Yeah, so so I did bounce this off of a few of our other team members that have been doing parallel databases and the world of uh, 
of in, of the industry is such that <laughs> the time frame is very hard for people to skip meetings and church days, even though a lot of us gave, you know, a lot of them gave me some good feedback. Um, so in general, I think I talked before about parallel databases and that a lot of the workloads we run, whether they're industry standard loads, um, we are probably going to be facing uh, multiple, you know, scaling graphs in, in very often in the real world. And, and so if there's some general algorithms we can apply and if there's things that you want to do to, to validate some of these assumptions, and I assume you're probably already doing it with your models, but, um, but yeah, database, uh, and then each database has a different <laughs> characteristic line, usually on, depending on the, the queries that you're running or depending on the OLTP. And, and so from a, from a system engineering, we actually have to manually characterize the workloads, you know, for various processor types, for various, uh, storage, for various networks and, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty fun actually, to tell you the truth. We, we really get into making sure they're not bottlenecks within single systems. And then hopefully when you get to parallel systems uh, of multi nodes, you know, our group is, is starting to do quite a bit of scale work. So i um, quite interested in the topic, but uh, uh, probably more or, or Ben, you know, do you guys, how often are you able to do any validation? I think we started to talk about it and we don't have to cover it here, but if, unless I see some other folks, I'm bringing that message back from my team to you guys that it would be great to know if um, some of our products are even doing the right thing. Right? Yeah, so so we're, we're super interested in this right now. So um, we're working with a database team at, at, um, at CMU, and so the, the goal of the collaboration is to find uh, good crossovers between the the database world and and the sort of scheduling work that that we do so you know more has other students who are doing different kinds of scheduling work but in talking to them it really seems like the the work that's best suited for for implementation in the databases is the kind of stuff that i was just talking about and we had the exact same impression after looking at tpch which is that you really do have kind of this last you know the, the stuff i was talking about in the last section of the talk where you have general speed up curves of various forms. And um, our impression from talking to the, the CMU people, so you, you can confirm or deny this, is that often what is implemented in these systems is some form of what we would call first come, first serve, right? Yeah. So it's possible yeah, FIFO. that- First in, first yeah, in. Yeah, FIFO, sure. Um, so it's possible that you know jobs might declare some maximum degree of parallelism if they know they scale really poorly after some point. But modulo that, you basically run things in the order they come in because it's it, from an engineering standpoint, it's easy. And um, I don't know, people haven't been convinced of the performance benefits of doing some more complex scheduling. So what we were really hoping to show in real systems, working with the people at CMU, is that we can develop better scheduling policies based on the kinds of results that I was just talking about, or even use TPCH as a as a guideline to develop new theory that we can then port into the into these real systems. So right. I guess I'm I'm curious right. if, if your impression on, on the systems that you've seen are doing similar things from from a, a scheduling standpoint, <laughs> state of the art. It sounds like maybe maybe yes, but maybe you can elaborate. Well, so I mean, if you if you're administrating you know, if you're the administrator of a data center or, or, or working on the policies, I guess that whether it's Kubernetes or Slurm or something, you probably have some knobs on, you know, waiting functions on what, whether to favor. So if, if they do have, uh, you know, job size predicted in your inelastic, you know, in inelastic load. So if they are predetermined, I suspect you know, that's, that's the case where you can at least, uh, you could apply, you know, your, your heuristics rather than, you know, sometimes we were right with our intuition, but quite, quite a few times we were actually wrong. Right. So hopefully that came out in the talk. So it was, um, it was really fun to see. Right. We would be very interested in getting any kind of data that Red Hat wants to share. 
So one of the things we noticed in working with TPCH is that people don't even understand for this benchmark that's been around forever. Um, it's really not well understood how well each of the queries parallelize, what their speed of functions look like. Um, even the database expert that we were working with would say, oh, I think the speed of function is basically, you know, very parallelizable, you know, linear, you know, linear speed up here. And then it would turn out, no, it wasn't. <laughs> In fact, it wasn't oh, yeah. under any possible way of configuring this. So, yeah. um, I mean, one of our, one of our leads, Sanjay Rao, you know, used to do and and in an old company i was with digital equipment and um, compact hp right for years and we published benchmarks and we optimized them uh bill, bill actually was in part of our team as well so some of us have migrated to red hat for more than 10 years right but the idea of within a single system right there was a you know he would go down through Query six is a full table scan. That's right. fully as long as you don't have that's enough right. IO bandwidth. And so that's an embarrassingly parallel job. Yeah. These other ones, oh, it's a fork join and that's a 30 to 40 percent. So we we literally could build tables in 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 the olden days when we published, you know, now, now we actually help people publish. We just make sure the OS on a single large host can scale up. And then as we scale across, we try to make sure Kubernetes tries to stay out of the way. I'm, a, I'm an old hardware engineer, so I used to like get software out of the way, right? Make it schedule, get, you know, and let the let the computes go into, uh, you know, let the hardware run at the speed of hardware, right? And, uh, yeah. and obviously minimizing context switching and all the other overheads associated with, with trying to swap, swap out certain jobs and swap in um, other jobs. It gets even harder at the job level if you're trying to an HPC test usually would have to get checkpointed right before you then relinquish the hardware and and then you let another whole uh, large set of jobs in. Do you have um, any papers or white papers or anything that talk about the TPCH workloads, um, both with respect <coughs> to their speed of yeah, functions I can, I can dig and, a few up. and the good. inherent sizes? So, I mean, we're measuring all this now, but we would ideally like to cite something that others found. In, in the day, it was the battle of the database, right? So it was Oracle was trying to beat up on, you know, and then you'd have Informix or you had um, shared nothing. Microsoft SQL Server has a scale out, you know, doesn't need, and then they had different models. Once Oracle needed shared storage, so fiber channel and versus now we can just scale out in cloud. Uh, percent, you know, if you go to modern databases, no SQL, Mongo or Cassandra and stuff. YCSB is another interesting loads, uh, and or you know, so your mileage varies, but but there's less, um, uh, you know, there's less uh, database and query processing, uh, and things have gotten a little more less less contributions to the industry standard. So it's TPCD for decision support that eventually went to TPCH because the database people started evaporating queries. They would pre-calculate, oh, when I build this huge table that doesn't fit in in memory and has to go to storage, if while I'm building, if, if I kind of pre-compute the sum or the, and so they used, uh, they, they almost killed the benchmark, right? So they renamed it TPCH that doesn't allow uh, transparent views. Uh, you know, there's there's other workloads. I'm not saying H alone is, uh, you know, SAP HANA has have their own entire suite of of queries that they run internally. And by the way, they don't <laughs> they don't publish anything. This is their own proprietary, mm -hmm. uh, you know, data warehouse. So. Yeah. So so I guess that that gets at exactly what Moore was was kind of getting at, which is for for us as queuing theory people. Um, the, the most convincing thing we can do is like look at actual traces of queries that came into real systems um, or at least, you know, things that were generated ba based on, on, you know, those kinds of statistics, yeah. right? So, so, so in the TPCH what benchmarks. Do, what we used to do, just a quick little tip is rather than try to do 22 queries, we would do the extremes, the embarrassingly parallel workload looks like this. And then the, here's a, 40% of the other workloads fall into this 50% parallelizable. And these four other queries, these last 10% are 
horrible. They're, they're only 20, 15 or 20 percent paralyzed. And so if you did small, medium and large speed ups and just maybe showed the diverse change in your scheduling, that might be a, an interesting modeling approach. And that's so, somewhat doable, right? Yeah, no, that that sounds great. Like, and I, and I think we can totally go measure that, um, at least on the hardware that we have access to for TPCH. And, you know, if if you all at Red Hat wanted to measure that on, on the hardware or the systems that you guys are using, that's a, a great way to back up the kind of results that, that we're getting from our database group at CMU. I guess my question is more about um, this, I, this question of like arrival times and inherent sizes of jobs, right? So, you know, it's one thing for, um, you know, TPCH, I'm, I'm a, a bit of an outsider in the, in the community, but as far as I understand it, there's some scale parameter there where you basically choose how big your, your tables are, which determines effectively what your jobs inherent sizes are, the number of rows that a particular table scan has to process. And, and that's like a knob that you turn and you see how things scale in terms of that knob, which is good as sensitivity analysis. But we're interested in something that's a little bit different in the scheduling world, which is once I have a realistic mix of job sizes and percentages of queries. So, you know, maybe in practice, you know, if I'm whatever it is, some financial institution and I have some, some database that I run, you know, maybe half of my queries are people checking their balance and maybe half of my queries are people transferring money from one account to another, right? And so that's 50% query one and 50% query 11. And so I, I get these different arrival rates of jobs of different sizes with, as you said, different scaling behavior. And from our standpoint, you know, the, the most convincing way to estimate what those mixes are is to is look at actual traces of the queries that were submitted to different systems. So I'm wondering if you guys have data in, in that vein that it's possible to share, um, even, in, even in like an anonymized way, right? So we don't care about particular keys or table names or anything, but just what the query type was and how long it ran and that kind of information. Unfortunately, we have probably a, a you know, a boatload of data that <laughs> could sink a battleship. <laughs> um, but I don't think we want to torture you with that because fundamentally we're looking for um, making sure that um, if if our operating system was used, that uh, we're usually single system, as I mentioned. And many of these these problems across the grids in a, in a supercomputing environment um, fundamentally get down to uh, interconnect bandwidth and interconnect latency. So so that's why you've seen InfiniBand being used heavily in all the supercomputing centers when almost no one else was using, and I shouldn't say no one else, but we, you know, most of the other people using networking. So so now networking is more uh, available in, in the high end too, whether it's Mellanox, Intel, or, um, you know, you name your, there's actually four or five other fairly popular, you know, FPGAs are coming out up to 400 gig with Xilinx and solar flare types of networks. So the bottom line there, they just wanna, they really wanna give you, if you're doing MPI message passing to parallelize, Bill, that's probably more, maybe you can comment. For, for parallel databases, we try to be able to configure enough physical IO to the server so that we can saturate the CPU. So it becomes a balanced, you know, why not, you don't necessarily buy a, a monster set of CPUs unless you have the IO subsystem. And then finally, the TPC is very good at balancing memory, CPU, and, and IO together. But so you could get different characteristics. If if you shared what your systems are and maybe, and what type of storage and what type of, or, or, or how many nodes you're doing and things like that, maybe we could try to zero in on some common themes, but. Right, maybe maybe um, that's a different way to go. So maybe a different way to go that you might feel more comfortable with is maybe we could share what we're doing on the systems end. So when we get around to our final implementation, which will be optimized for TPCH, because that's all we have. So but when we okay. get around to here, or ha here is how we decided to schedule the TPCH queries. Maybe we could give our implementation to you and you could look at that and 
you know, either run it in house or run it on your queries or, you know, figure out sure. how to change it to work with your queries or something. I mean, so we're you... hoping to do some kind of information transfer. That's the whole reason of doing this. Right. But, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, but I want to go back a second because I'm, I'm a little confused. So, so for example, I mean, don't you have use cases where the database is, um, you know, I understand that it might the queries that a single box sees might be um, part of a larger distributed database, right? But isn't there a common use case where things are basically sharded, and so it it makes sense to look at just the traffic seen by a single box? I mean, because that's what we're really interested in. We, we always we always start with a single box, yeah, and then more and more as you go to so single boxes, and again, so instead of when we were part of a hardware design team, we would try to make our design run as fast. And the database companies actually kind of control the parallelism, kind of control how they broke up the query plan and how they've optimized it, you know, for, you know, for that set of 22 queries, two updates, they make you run a single job, right? A power run is a single parallel job and you're gonna end up having idle time, if you've configured it properly, you probably aren't even close to saturating uh, the server for the single parallel job, although some queries probably will, because then they make you run what's called a throughput run, where if you were a scale factor of 10 terabytes, you'd have to run seven streams. And that's the use case. I think your optimization, when you do distribute the load across a cluster, and you have to run seven different streams, or if you go to a larger case, and what's what's kind of crazy is they don't, they just sort of, they wanted to keep the, the benchmark scalable, so they made you decide on, and they didn't want everybody to run, like if you did a one terabyte now, people put that into memory, right? That's not even an IO benchmark. So they allow you to go to different scale sizes to prove your capability and and by the way the larger sizes also have more degree of parallelism right so there's more parallel work your synchronization overhead gets less and uh, so it's the multi stream that i think today you just fire it off at every node and every node you know runs and you try to get the you know you as i said the first job out and the very last job in that is your your metric on how many queries per hour um, you know, and then there's all the other pricing rules. We don't, we're not going to run it in within, <laughs> in fact, we don't run the updates, right? We just, we just run the queries so that you don't, uh, disturb the database so you can run it over and over again. Right. So, okay. So Ben, are you also looking at traditional HPC MPI jobs or maybe distributed mean machine learning, uh, uh things yeah so so the the distributed machine learning stuff is is an interesting area for us um we would love again um you know just to, to harp on the theme here we would love more visibility into what those streams of those jobs look like you know our our impression is that um as far as training jobs are concerned those tend to be fairly parallelizable and, and then as far as like the model serving jobs are concerned, those tend to be sort of more sequential, you know, you apply some weights and spit out a model prediction. And so we thought that that was a good um, target perhaps for, you know, this model of having some sort of more elastic jobs and more inelastic jobs. So again, if there's any like shared machine learning cluster that's in use that you could could share traces with us for of, you know, this is the job that was submitted and this is how long it took to complete. And this is the number of nodes that it utilized or the number of GPUs that it ran on or, you know, whatever the right granularity of, I don't know how things are disaggregated right in your, in your machine learning cluster. Um, that's all really interesting to us. We would love to have more visibility into that area, but, but it, it is, you know, it's worth pointing out all the distributed machine learning algorithms, all the distributed gradient, stochastic gradient descent, these things, exhibit the exact same kind of concave speed up curves that we were talking about in this talk. So it's really interesting to us as, so, as a direction. Are you aware of the, the ML perf uh, benchmark suite? Um, I, I haven't looked into it much, no. Uh, well, so you just look look up ML perf. Um, okay. The big cloud vendors and NVIDIA 
and others are are submitting results to that. And they have it's a benchmark uh, suite, so there are different things in there that do different things. And I wonder if any of that information would be available. Hmm. Uh, and what you know, what does that scheduling layer typically look like? I mean, is that well, I think it's so. There's different applications. I think it's actually different with different applications. Um, okay. And most, the distributed machine learning is is kind of weird because it's sort of partially parallel, and and then you have all these all reduces every once in a while, right? I mean, it, it so it, it's a mixture of of synchronization and parallel things. But anyway, I, you, right. look up Emma Perf and see see if okay. any of that looks like an interesting case study. Okay, I'm I'm looking it up online right now, so yeah, I can see it here. I, I should say, you know, on that topic, the other the other thing which I, I didn't mention in the talk because we didn't really have time, but uh, that that is really interesting to us is for what you just mentioned, Bill, which also shows up in the TPCH benchmarks, at least in the system that we're looking at, the way it's implemented things, right? Is that a single job, you know, even if it's a parallelizable job, really is consisting of parallelizable stages which scale really well. Right. And then, and then aggregation stages, which are mostly, if not totally, <laughs> sequential, right? Right. Um, and so, figuring out actually how to schedule those types of jobs is is something that we're interested in. It's been done a little bit in the um, in the literature, but in a very different style of analysis than what we do. So, uh, people have gotten these sort of worst case results about how to schedule those kinds of jobs, but yeah. but that's also really interesting to us. Yeah, and one other question I was kind of wondering, not not that we need to discuss it, but I mean, of course we have, um, maybe embarrassing to ask this question as Perf team members, but we have customers that are really interested in utilization, right, and efficiency. And if that were your your goal instead of uh, minimizing the mean response time, and how, how would that change your your work and recommendations? Can, that right, so question? can you explain that? Just one second, I just want to interrupt. When you say they're interested in utilization, okay, um, they're interested in seeing that all the servers are busy, even if those servers aren't doing anything for them. So they I, don't I want, want to waste their money. Well, the cloud vendors are they with hope that you're not firm doing. because because they hope you're not doing anything. Well, okay, so I just want to be careful with this term utilization. Okay, utilization is the fraction of time that server is busy. Okay, and it is very easy to say i'm going to keep servers busy in a non-constructive way like so so more I, I think there's a we we in the queuing theory yeah. community use the use the word busy in perhaps a different way than a, a systems person would right okay. so to a queuing theorist um a server is busy if it has had a job assigned to it right but to a systems person right i might have pinned my my thread to a particular core Right. And so the queuing theorist would say, well, that core is busy. Right. But if what that thread is doing is blocking on some mutex, right? Exactly. Then it then it's not busy. Um, and so people use utilization as this proxy metric for what we would call a sort of, I think maybe efficiency is um is is another way to say it, right? Which is um people use utilization to mean constructive work more. Constructive. So work. So, so if you are, so, so let's use the example of with these speed up functions, right? If you're way out on a um, speed up function, one of the reasons that happens is perhaps there's some mutex which you have to wait on. And so you would say, I've allocated you this server, right? So, you know, in, in our world, in our theoretical world, that server is allocated. But from a utilization standpoint, what's actually, you know, reported through top, the 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 um, Linux util that might be a low percent of CPU utilization if all I'm doing is blocking. Um, yeah. So so that's why I think it gets. Well, so, so HPC would definitely not be really blocking. I think it's more cloud uses that would want high high tenancy, and they remember their their deal is they want to they want to give you the least amount of service so that you're happy. So, so yeah, I, I, in full disclosure, I, I spent a summer uh, working for Google Cloud doing the, yeah. doing exactly yeah. this. So I worked I worked on their custom Linux scheduler doing their their overcommitment mechanism. Um, yeah, there you go. 
It's yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so, but, so but, that's but, a but, different, that's yeah. a different goal then. Right. But, but more, you're right though. If, if you, if your goal is to get the jobs done as efficiently as possible, you usually can save costs somewhere there too. Right. And, and I think our work goes in that direction. If we're telling everybody to operate in the better part of their speed up curve, if you're biasing towards jobs, you know, letting jobs complete who can make use of, you're biasing towards giving cores to those jobs that can make use of them. That's a good thing. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So, so in, in, so, in particular, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave, guys. Okay. But I, I was curious if uh, Maura and, and Ben, if you want to share with Bill and I, if there's some other in, you know, engagement, we can get Sanjay's, get a half hour with you sometime and just at least share what we can today because it's such a changing, you know, database world and TPCH is, is so dynamic that I wouldn't want to give you the stuff that was like, oh, that was, that's so six months old or five years old or whatever. Because I listed in there HammerDB to drive the database mm -hmm. and, and some of the databases we have in-house. We, we can't share the SAP and and quite frankly, we don't do much with Oracle other than make sure it runs well because because they borrowed our operating system from us a number of years ago. I was involved to help help Oracle make the uh, move over to Linux, but then yeah, so we you know CentOS and stuff like that is available, which is fine, especially for academics. But um, but so we still will run it, but we do much more work on the, the open source databases. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a great idea. I think this is a good kickoff for, for a, a, another longer conversation. So um, we'll just follow up by email and, and we'll find a time that, that works for us to uh, I'll get another half hour on the calendar. So I'll, bail. I'll bail, but you guys can feel free to I, I keep going on, Bill. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, great. great job, yeah, you guys. Think, thanks for all the help. Really well. Good job, Bill. Oh, yeah. Well, th thank you all Bye -bye. for the help in, in preparing.